So I will introduce uh, Katie Snell, our speaker for today. And um, so um, Katie Snell uh, began her career in the uh, Colorado uh, College, uh, then moved on to uh, Santa Cruz uh, to do her uh, PhD, uh, and moved to Caltech to get her uh, to do her postdocs in uh, John Eiler's group. Uh, and finally got a position at the CU Boulder, where she's at uh, right now. Um, Katie, research mostly revolves around um, really trying to understand terrestrial records uh, and what do they mean. Um, and uh, she, she's mostly uh, working with um, you know, carbonates, uh, terrestrial carbonates, um, trying to understand the um, physical meaning of, of isotopic signals in them and using these signals, you know, tell stories about or, or really um, look into uh, past climates, uh, uh, past landscapes, topography and uh, tectonics and ecology. So, you know, giving a very, uh, you know, a whole, wholesome uh, picture of, of the past in, in very challenging uh, records. So Katie, I'm very excited to uh, have you here and um, stage is all yours. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen in just a second. And thanks again for inviting me. It, that's also been a silver lining, I think, of mm -hmm. COVID times is getting a chance to do things like this where um, with finances and everything else, it's, it's hard to get. We certainly have trouble getting international speakers to come. And mm -hmm. so it's a um, fun opportunity. Let's see. Okay, and everybody sees my screen? Yes. Great. So as, uh, as Yuri said, my areas of focus have been in um, terrestrial paleoclimate and because we tend to use paleoclimate information to reconstruct elevation, I also do a decent amount of that work as well. Um, the talk today, I'm gonna talk about an aspect of the data sets we generate from clumped isotope thermometry of carbonates um, that at least in the terrestrial realm, we, we, we get for free and we really haven't utilized very much. And I've produced a lot of data in the Western US now. And so I'm gonna talk about what, you know, in a broader sense, these individual data sets, when we look at and compare um, the oxygen isotope side of that story, um, what we're starting to learn. So um, these are member, current members of my group. So I'll mention bits and pieces of things that they've worked on, but then there's also a whole host of other collaborators um, that have worked on individual um, data sets within this um, facet. Mm -hmm. And I've tried really hard not to make this a really jam-packed full talk because I understand, I understand the Zoom fatigue, but also please feel free to speak mm -hmm. up and um, unmute yourself and ask me a question partway through if you want. I'm not sure with all of these things, if you use the raise hand function that I'll see you. So I would just encourage you, please stop me along the way if there's anything you wanna ask. Um, I'm happy to, happy to stop and answer questions. Okay, so um, as, as, as we said, you know, the, the big broad motivating for, um, questions for me is in the broadest sense, how do terrestrial environments respond to global climate changes on both long and short time scales? And how can we read some of these records to better understand how origins evolve in response to different tectonic drivers? And, Right, so whether you're thinking about surface processes or other kinds of um, things like that, paleoclimate and tectonics, especially when we think about terrestrial paleoclimate, um, really uh, uh, interact with each other, both in terms of their influence on each other throughout earth history, but also on a lot of the, the, the their signals are often sort of convolved um, in the records that we end up looking, to, looking at. Um, and both paleoclimate and tectonics affect um, some of our kind of fundamental uh, parameters of the climate system, um, things like temperature and also, you know, the hydrologic cycle, aridity and things like that. Um, and of course, when you add up a lot of those, um, you're talking about biological effects. So what kinds of effects did the tectonic changes, the climatic changes and things like that have on um, flora and fauna through time, both from an extinction standpoint, radiation standpoint, um, uh, and different kinds of um, assemblage changes that we might find. So 
where my work fits into this is in aspects of trying to reconstruct the temperature and changes in aridity or other facets of, of hydroclimate. Um, and I won't talk about these, but just in case there's time for questions, a lot for me, a lot of this work, especially with um, working on carbonates, inevitably involves certain amounts of investigation into diagenesis and diagenetic effects on carbonates, um, as well as kind of improving our understanding of how to interpret temperatures and O18 records out of um, out of the different carbonate facies that we get by working on different modern calibrations. And I will, I'll mention a little bit about what we're doing on that um, near the end. Okay, so I won't belabor this too much since you have both Yuri and Hagit there. I'm sure a lot of you have heard some of this, but I just, I'll do this as a quick reminder that it's a handy geothermal, isotopic geothermometer that has two key twists on kind of the traditional system we're used to thinking about. One important twist on this is that the isotopic equilibrium we're interested in here is a reordering equation. So um, instead of looking at the um, exchange between two different phases, things like water and a carbonate mineral, um, here we're just interested in reordering um, among, different, uh, among the carbonate ions. So we're interested in the propensity um, for a C13 in one carbonate ion and an O18 in another one to clump together into a, a single carbonate ion and another one to be left um, unclumped or basically unsubstituted. So right, it's got all of the light common isotopes. And it turns out that um, that clumping behavior is temperature dependent. So at colder temperatures, you're gonna drive the system um, to greater abundances of um, clumped carbonate ions. And the other kind of key twist is that we have a dynamic reference point, right? So this is kind of the normal delta notation you're probably used to seeing. The key difference is that instead of just thinking about putting things relative to the ratio of a standard, you know, something we measured over and over and called zero, here we have this kind of dynamic reference point where um, we account for changes differences between different carbonate ion or different carbonate minerals from different settings that have a different bulk composition. Um, and the fact that that can, you know, the more C13s and O18s you might have in a lake, say, the more you expect on, st on statistical grounds to end up with, you know, more of um, this clumped mass carbonate ion. Um, and so this helps us account for that. So the punchline of all of this without getting into too many more details is that it's a it's an awesome tool from a potential standpoint because the temperature you get is actually independent from the bulk isotopic composition of the mineral it forms from. So you're finally getting around the traditional problem of needing to know the O18 of the water. And it's kind of a two for one deal. You make this measurement at the same time that you also measure the masses 45 and 46 that give you your C13 and O18. And so you can calculate out a more constrained estimate of the O18 of water than you could before. So from a terrestrial perspective, I think this is super powerful. This has been a big challenge for us because the O18 of water is so variable on land and temperature can be so extremely variable. And so here we get a chance to do a better job at both of those. Okay, so it's always worth then checking back in, super powerful tool, but what does a CAT47 temperature actually tell us? And this is where from a geologic perspective, so much of the interpretation really exists. Um, and so my opinion is that the key to really unlocking how to use these CAP 47 temperatures is detailed look together at the com combined effects of lithology and geochemistry. So this is getting into, you know, dialing in your sediment, your carbonate sedimentology, understanding your carbon, different carbonate facies, both at a large scale, are you talking about a soil with carbonate? Are you talking about a lake with carbonate? Are you talking about a wetland? Um, and even small scales, you, if you think about um, lakes, of course, you can have a wide range of different carbonate facies from microbialites to orthogenic micrite that forms and, and things like that. And so those are all topics under active research by a, a lot of other people in the community as well in terms of understanding what temperature do you get um, out of, what CAP47 temperature do you get out of different carbonate types? Um, and so this is just kind of a summary of a lot of different things that I've worried about for our terrestrial carbonates, things like issues of soil depth and water depth and how that reflects, because of course this isn't a proxy for air temperature, this is a proxy for some flavor of soil water or so, um, soil temperature or some flavor of 
lake water temperature, right? Um, obviously, things that are going to affect this are the timing of carbonate formation. I tend to work in mid-latitude sites. We have a nice seasonal, uh, annual seasonal cycle, so it's going to matter a lot um, when carbonate actually forms. Does it form in the summer? Does it form in the winter? Does it form in some weird patch throughout the year? Um, and then obviously, how do you read out the diversity of O18 water um, and the effects of seasonality embedded in a bunch of these different things? Okay, so it's just an overview. I kind of um, got into this a bit already. We tend to think of, if this is a generic cartoon of, our, of a terrestrial environment, we have lots of, um, say, an inner montane basin here where we might have a bunch of different environments that produce carbonates. We have some lakes, we probably have some adjacent soils, we have groundwater processes, um, and all of them ought to reflect changes in air temperature and changes in the O18 of precipitation, which are you know, what we think about when we're reconstructing climate, but they all have their own flavors of adjustment from that, right? So soils, we um, tend to think of these as most often biased to warm seasons in terms of carbonate timing of carbonate formation. So again, that's an active area of research. Um, and you know, we are working on, one thing we're working on in my lab that I'll talk about a little later is this question of soil texture. So are you talking about fine grain soil, a coarse grain soil? Do you have big class and your carbonate is forming on the undersides of those class coatings? Or are you talking about nodules that are forming in a fine grained and maybe even clay rich soil? You can imagine they may not have the same sets of seasonal biases or other kinds of influences um, that um, you know, a coarse grain soil may have. And right now, most of the work that's been done has been done on these coarser grain soils. Okay. So that's kind of a perspective. If we think about lakes and groundwater um, and wetlands, there's been a lot less done. Um, one postdoc who worked in my group, Michaela Ingalls, um, worked with Lizzie Trower and I on some really cool um, modern calibration work in Great Salt Lake, looking at microbialites and a bunch of other carbonate facies. Um, and again, the general punchline is most of those are giving some kind of warm season bias, which is what most of the orthogenic carbonate seems to do from other lake studies. Um, but one cool thing that came out of that is the oud facies. So all of your nice little tiny oud grains seem to do a better, the best job of homogenizing and averaging, say, the sort of millennial time scale climate change um, and sort of climate signal within that record. Um, and so that's, a, that's an interesting thing to think about um, in terms of um, differentiating carbonate facies and, and which targets might be the best to go after for paleoclimate records. Okay, so that's just, and groundwater and wetlands are open questions from a standpoint of plumped isotope temperatures. Um, my student, Ann Fetro is currently working on some wetlands um, in Spain, or she was before COVID hit. Um, and, and again, it's an ephemeral wetland that produces a bunch of carbonate and dries out on sort of both annual and sort of decadal timescales in different flavors of drought. And so it's a really complex um, and interesting system to work with. But I think this is gonna become really important for us to understand because from a carbonate facies perspective, um, I think it's both an underutilized and often under-recognized carbonate facies in the terrestrial record that we often think it is either a pedogenic story or a lake story and is actually probably something in between. We just hadn't interpreted it as um, a wetland. And I'll make a mention of that a little bit later too. Okay, so here I'm gonna introduce you to the broader framework of data that I've been producing since I started working with clumped isotopes in the Western US. Um, and there's a bunch going on, so let me orient you to a bunch of things on this plot. So on the left-hand side, we have um, a modified version of the Zakos curve. So this is kind of a hodgepodge of, of, of the Zakos curve plus a version out of Kramer that helps extend it back into the late Cretaceous. Um, I need to update that to the beautiful new um, version in Westerhold 2020. Um, but it's meant as just a reference point for our view on global climate trends from the late Cretaceous onward. Um, and then in this plot, everything that's in red is a clumped isotope temperature estimate and everything in blue is a mean annual temperature estimate based on leaf margin analysis, right? So this is that technique that says, well, 
To the emergent leaves, a greater proportion of them in a suite of fossils suggests colder temperatures, smooth, a greater proportion of smooth margin species suggests warmer temperatures. Um, and that's really from a perspective of this time scale of information. The leaf margin record is probably the best quantitative um, sort of other perspective on temperature change in the Western US that we have. Okay. So, and then this just gives you, this is just a reference point for in the present day, looking at um, a few of the localities that our data come from. So Northwest Wyoming and the Big Horde Basin, Central Utah, Las Vegas, this is where Kate Huntington's data, which is in here, um, comes from. And just gives you a sense of both what the mean annual temperature is in that location, and then the actual seasonal range of temperature with your sort of warm month mean temperature uh, added in there on the end. So there's a bunch of different factors to sort of think about in this plot. One is that, well, there's a lot going on. And at first glance, there's a lot of noise. But even with the sort of high amount of variability in here, you can pick out key trends in both the leaf margin data, um, the clumped isotope data, and then when they're parsed by potential elevation of the site, the time of deposition, you can even see that when you separate out the different elevations. So um, you know, warmest temperatures um, on average tend to be here. Um, in the early Eocene, which makes sense, right? That's our apex of warmth in the Cenozoic. You have on average cooler conditions as you head towards the present. And you can see that part from what data we do have in basically all of the records, right? This is apparent in these, the solid symbols for both records are meant to be the lower elevation sites and the hollow symbols are unknown, but potentially um, higher elevation sites. So you see that long-term average cooling in all of these records. Um, you also see on average an offset to cooler temperatures and everything that we think was at some, was not at sea level and at some higher elevation, even if we don't necessarily know exactly how high elevation those were. Um, and then there's a few other interesting tidbits. Embedded in here, right, the triangles are all paleosol carbonates, if we're going to talk about our faces, and our circles are all um, lacustrine carbonate, and you can see that in places and times where we have both, they generally tell the same, they're roughly telling the same story. They mostly overlap with each other. So at face value, the assumption that you're not, not knowing any better, that you're going to get a warm season bias to both um, lacustrine carbonates and soil carbonates seems like um, a decent one to make without knowing anything different. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, and then this map is just um, to give you a sense for the spatial distribution of where a lot of these different things are coming. And so there's also a, a few other things that you can't pick out at this scale, right? We have actually a decent latitudinal gradient represented by our sites. Um, and in places where you can differentiate, like these two couple symbols down here come from the two medicine formation up here in Montana versus the rest of the suite, which come from central Utah. And you can see that even within there, they're sitting on a slightly cooler spectrum in there versus the rest of the data. So patterns we expect to see in terms of latitudinal gradients and the offsets of which, which direction they should go um, seem to also um, be present in this data set. Okay. I want to next talk about, you know, the other obvious thing to talk about is just the sheer scale of variability in some of these records. Okay, so, and to, to get a sense for that, we can zoom in on two records that have somewhat similar and really high, you know, they're a coherent data set from a single location in each case and have a lot of data behind them. And so what you can see if you parse this, right, at face value, they kind of apparently extend almost the same range of temperatures. But when you actually look at the um, distribution of these temperatures, you can see that um, for the early Eocene in the Bighorn Basin, we're getting you know, a good four to six degrees on average warmer conditions um, than what you have in, um, uh, in from uh, the Mead Basin in Southwest Kansas during the Miocene. So again, on average cooler in the way that it should be based on what we know from marine records, right? The Miocene is a cooler time than the early Eocene. Um, here in this basin, we actually have multiple carbonate types so in terms of looking at a difference between paleocell carbonates and palestrin carbonates or these wetland carbonates, 
right? The distributions are about the same. So again, that assumption that um, at face value, assuming they're giving you a reflection on summertime temperature um, uh, for both of those records for this region seems to be a, a safe assumption. Okay. Um, and then the other thing to say, we can zoom in on this one even further and, and actually look at the source of a lot of this variability. And I would argue, at least for this data set, right, that's not simple noise, that's higher um, resolution climate trends that we've captured within those records. So this is a low, say, half million year resolution record um, that we generated to try and match the same resolution as the leaf margin mean annual temperature record in the Bighorn Basin. And a lot of the features of that record um, are similar in the clumped record, right? Warm temperatures here at the PETM, this hint of cooling, which seems to be a regional signal, right? The, if you look at the PETM um, in this sort of area around the PETM, um, in global records, you don't seem to have this um, apparent cooling trend, but it shows up in both the soil carbonates and the leaf margin temperatures. We also, in the interest of going after some of the other early Eocene hyperthermal events, so these are other smaller rapid global warming events that people have discovered as a, in the marine records as they've gotten higher and higher resolution. Um, we um, looked at those records as well. And here, right, zoomed in to even yet one more level, all these orange symbols um, are over here. We have two negative carbon isotope excursions that are the ETM2 and H2 hyperthermal events. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, right, we get a temperature signal that seems to go along with those carbon isotope excursions, basically showing peak temperatures um, at sort of corresponding to um, peak negative carbon isotope values. Um, these end up, an interesting aspect of it, though I'm not going to spend too much time on it, is if you actually look at the magnitudes implied of temperature change. It's quite warm and basically on par with what we have in the PETM in that location, like seven to nine degrees C of warming. So um, that's been an interesting question because it doesn't seem like marine records show that much warming. So one question is, is this a regional response? You know, when we start thinking about climate trends today, there's a lot of question about what happens in terrestrial areas. Um, are they gonna see the same amount of warming if we think about versus say the global record or what you're gonna see in marine records. And so this might give us some glimpse into, if you wanna consider it, a regional climate sensitivity of this area, how much that region will actually warm. Um, uh, yeah, and that's, in the Bighorn Basin, that's interesting. They have such a rich fossil record um, that it's one place where you can actually tie things like the magnitude of temperature change to, um, to fossil migrations. You have a whole bunch of both, um, uh, floral change of things that go uh, locally extinct during the PETM and then come back where they think it's a, an expression of migration of um, uh, the plant zones. And also um, you have uh, changes in the assemblage, assemblages of the animals and dwarfing of a lot of the mammals within the Bighorn Basin, which they see in each of these events. Um, so it's been fun to, working to try and tie some of those things together. Okay. So I just wanted to give some context for the temperature side of it, even though I said that wasn't going to be my focus, um, just to you know, give you guys some sense that in this bigger comp compilation of data, um, I think we're seeing we, we can get at both high and low resolution, long term and short term climate trends, and we can see an elevation signal. So we can then take that data set um, and Right, for every single one of these points, we have an estimate of the O18 of water that that carbonate mineral formed from as well. And that's what this plot is on the right hand side. And again, there are some interesting features, right? There's a fair amount of variability in some different records. Our sort of high versus low elevation binning of the data seems to largely hold with the O18 of water, right? We expect at a basic level, if you're talking about a large uh, across a large landscape, you expect the O18 of water in these high elevation locations to be um, lighter than uh, the O18 of water in lower elevation sites. And that's borne out pretty well with some exceptions. Um, one notable one is here. This is the Sheep Pass Formation in central um, Nevada, which we think was probably at an elevation of two kilometers, the basin itself, if not a little higher. Um, and the lowest portions of the section um, show, they, these are lacustrine carbonates, 
so relatively light values. Um, but by the time you get to upper parts of the member B section, you have pretty significantly heavy values. And this is where, again, the lithology of what's going on, you know, what the facies um, suggestions, um, uh, facies indications really help um, show is, um, you know, by the time you get to the top of this section, you have significantly larger amounts of dolomite. The facies change to suggest that the lake basin itself is becoming a bit more closed. So probably what you're seeing here is an effect of that change on a lake system so that you're moving towards a more closed basin lake system that's more influenced by evaporation than it was at the lower parts, um, in the lower parts of the section. Okay, so that's the, the zoomed out view of this whole data set. Um, it's what becomes really interesting is looking at a bunch of these and comparing a bunch of these individual data sets from um, single sites. Okay, so we'll zoom first, like we did with the temperatures to the Bighorn Basin. Um, and some of this is, I'm kind of walking you guys through the evolution of my own thinking on these data sets as I've built them and, and seen them and kind of had more perspective. So, you know, this comes from the first record that I generated with clumped isotopes. And one of the interesting things was this strong um, relationship between the OET of water and temperature. So there's a bunch of different ways to think about what this could be. Um, that relationship is about 0.3 per mil per degree C. And then these other colors represent other carbonates, um, secondary carbonates or recrystallized carbonates, right? So these are spars. Um, that co-occur in the paleocell carbonates. They give you some perspective for burial temperatures we see in that region. And this, these temperatures match pretty well with other estimates that put um, burial of these sediments about a kilometer and a half down before they are re-exhumed. Um, and gives you, you know, the nice part is it gives you some perspective on the O18 of water that you're working with um, in those regions. And this particular sample that came out um, recrystallized, you know, from a geochemical standpoint and, and temperature standpoint is basically, you can see it sort of being dragged towards that secondary spar end member. And so it, we interpreted that as a sign, right? That it's probably been recrystallized in the presence of these burial fluids. Um, but it also means, um, uh, it also helps us sort of interpret this record, which I'll talk about in just a second. So one thing that's interesting to think about is that soil water, you know, the, the canonical view of what happens with soil water is that it tends to be um, heavier than some of the other regional waters. So like stream waters or river waters in the same region, which people have largely attributed to evaporative O18 enrichment relative to a lot of the other, um, relative to a lot of other um, nearby waters. Um, and the other thing to point out, uh, right, we also know in, in modern times, um, right, and this is a lot of the background of um, thermometry during in, in um, glacial interglacial records or was traditionally was, you know, since the 60s, we've known there's a strong relationship between the O18 of water and temperature, right? There is its temperature imparts its own signal um, from, via fractionation when you're um, uh, condensing water from vapor. Um, and if you look at that based on a modern spatial distribution of data, that tends to be something around 0.6 per mil per degree C. Okay, so we see this relationship. We saw this relationship in the first Bighorn Basin data set. We saw a similar one for, you know, that zoomed in high resolution data set from the Bighorn Basin that's just focused on those two additional hyperthermals. It's a little bit lower, but they're basically within uncertainty of each other. Um, and so it, there's been interesting questions about what that relationship reflects. Um, so one way to interpret it is to say, oh, well, this is probably a sign of diagenesis or, or alteration of the, um, the isotopes and the temperature associated with um, low water rock uh, ratio recrystallization or, and or solid state reordering, right? Um, a way to think about that this is a nice sort of cartoon um, model to, that Kristen Bergman put together to think about this. Um, you know, if you have basically closed system, low water rock ratio alteration or true solid state reordering, you're going to change your temperature, reorder your temperature signal and change your um, O18, apparent O18 water um, along trajectories that follow contours of constant O18 of carbonate. Another way of saying that is 
if you're if it's all solid state reordering or it's low water rock ratios, you're not changing the bulk composition. And so the temperature that records will give you an apparent change in the O18 of water um, just because, you know, let's say all of your O18 carbonate um, is the same. And that's one of the interesting things about the O18 carbonate record in the Bighorn Basin is despite the span of time that it hits and crossing the PETM, you're large, there's largely no change in the O18 of carbonate in this data set. So that's one possible interpretation. The challenge we have based on the other bits of context for this data is that you know, we don't have the burial history that you would attribute to significant solid state reordering, right? It's been buried to a kilometer and a half, brought back up. You're probably talking about seeing temperatures of 50, 50 to 60 degrees for a few million years before it started coming back up. So you're not gonna do a lot of solid state reordering. Maybe there was some recrystallization, but again, most of the evidence we saw for recrystallization um, tends to be in association with these burial fluids. Um, and you know, you're talking about a range in the 30 to 45 degree range. So we didn't pull anything all the way up to some of the burial temperatures we know existed in the basin. So what are our other options? So one, the option that we went with in these original papers is basically arguing this is additional evidence that this O18 temperature relationship in the past, or when you look at it on a, in a temporal sense instead of a spatial sense like our modern relationship is, um, that that relationship tends to be shallower than the modern spatial relationship. And this has been argued in different ways by different people for different reasons. Um, and a lot of them, but with some convergence on the idea that you know, if you're looking at these past records, we should be looking at something like half the, half the slope of the relationship, um, which is certainly what we get um, and is also borne out with different materials from the Bighorn Basin, right? So if you combine the O18 of hematite that's been run with these leaf margin mean annual temperatures, that suggests about 0.36 per mil per degree C. Similarly, O18 from enamel carbonate plus the leaf margin temperatures um, gives you about 0.39 per mil per degree C. So internally consistent, but derived from different, vastly different materials with different propensities towards alteration, right? And the key one to me is this enamel carbonate, which tends to be a lot less susceptible to reordering because it's bound within the um, uh, uh, bioappetite than to a, a large number of other carbonate minerals. Okay, but I, I will confess, I will confess that, um, you know, that was our interpretation, but it's still, it was still something that gave me a little bit of pause. So um, one of the other things um, that occurred to me at the time was that if this is true, um, it also seems to imply that evaporation may not have affected these paleosol carbonates a lot, right? One idea would be, you could imagine that um, the rate of evaporation would probably increase as you're getting upwards to these temperatures. And so you could imagine that if that's happening, you'd expect to see progressively heavier and heavier values and which would drive kind of a steeper slope or even a nonlinear feature to this. Um, and so it's pretty hard to imagine that this is the steepened at only 0.3 per mil per degree C, that this is the steepened <laughs> version from evaporation because it would apply whatever temperature relationship it, it had without an evaporative influence would have been even lower than that. Okay, so, and we get a little bit of, um, perspective on this actually from one of the other data sets in that large Western US compilation. So what you're looking at are data from Mead Basin, Kansas. So these um, are a mixture of carbonate types from Southwest Kansas. They span about Miocene to Pleistocene in age. Most of them are Pliocene deposits. And one interesting thing about this location is that um, in the broader work we were doing, we brought out Bill Lukens, who's a terrestrial sedimentologist and paleopedologist and reinterpreted a lot of the sedimentology. So basically everything that had been carbonate in these sections had been originally interpreted as pedogenic carbonate. And what Bill found was, which made a lot of sense to me, was um, that they, he probably cut in half the number of things that were ended up, ended up being actually interpreted as true pedogenic carbonates, the kind of classic Vado zone, relatively um, well-drained soils. Um, and associated carbonate that we tend to think of when we think geochemically about pedogenic carbonates. 
Um, and a bunch of other things were different flavors of um, palestrin carbonates, um, probably water table associated carbonates um, and formations like that. And one thing that really helped with was making sense of this plot of data. So I had this plot of data before we had the lithology to pin to it. And we noticed that there were basically two populations of data. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what that meant. But then once we had the lithology to map on top of it, everything, almost everything that had been reinterpreted as a soil carbonate versus something that was a surface water carbonate, right? Good flow through uh, surface waters with good uh, flow through um, groundwaters, you know, things that weren't uh, were distinctly not soil water, Vado zone soil water, all basically plotted in this other population. So here we have basically lithology helping us say, okay, well, we have two different waters um, is what's going on with that offset. Um, and they both track this same sort of shallow slope. In this case, these ones look the same as our hyperthermal data set from before, right? At about 0.2 per mil, a slope of point, about 0.2 per mil per degree C. Um, so that, that's been, that was really interesting to me. And these are, have basically never been buried. They're Miocene to Pleistocene in age. So this can't be tracking um, low water, I don't think low water rock ratio alteration um, based on their age, their burial history and, uh, and other things going on. Okay, so where this leaves us though, again, if we come back to the question that I brought up earlier about, well, how would evaporation affect these relationships? Um, it's hard to imagine that a soil water trajectory versus well-drained surface water. So Bill interpreted a lot of the region as actually being based on the paleosols themselves and the wetlands that it's actually a fairly wet environment was fairly sort of a subhumid environment. Um, it's hard to imagine them having the same trajectories if you have soil water being potentially significantly more evaporatively enriched than your sort of um, open, open system surface waters. Um, and so I actually think this offset is about four per mil. The present day seasonal offset between mean annual water in the region and summer water in the region in terms of O18 is about five per mil. And so I think what you're seeing is a different influence of seasonal averaging of the O18 water signal and where you might be getting something closer to mean annual water out of your surface waters. Um, whereas you may see a more uh, stronger bias to summertime water um, uh, in the soil um, from the soil carbonates. Um, and having this information, this context in mind is giving us some hypotheses for some of the modern work we're gonna start doing. Okay. And how am I, how am I doing on time? Doing good? Okay, great. Um, so again, with those, those are kind of the most clear cut examples from the OET water data sets. Um, but so it's interesting to look at a few other locations and times and just see how this plays out. So here's a data set from Southwest Montana. These are early Eocene um, samples from the Sage Creek Formation. So this was a data set looking at um, samples that come from a big shift in the O18 of carbonate that was interpreted by Paige Chamberlain's group as a big uplift event in the Western US. So we were interested in what, in what became of that O18 shift if you applied clumped isotope. Um, temperatures to it. And one of the interesting things is when you look at that data set in O18 of water versus temperature, we get, even in that single data set, we get different behaviors. So everything that we reinterpreted as sort of a true paleocell carbonate nodule on that data set just kind of clusters. We don't see any of that strong um, relationship with the o with, between the O18 of water and temperature. Um, if you look at the things that we interpreted as cements, so the significance of this being it's much harder to attribute exactly what that carbonate um, is related to. Is it um, something that um, cemented after deposition a fair amount? Is it something that reflects conditions at the time of deposition, but maybe a different water, you know, a groundwater source rather than soil water? That one actually seems to show our sort of, again, low slope, O18 water versus temperature relationship. And again, this is about 0.2 per mil per degree C. So 
from this data set, this is a compelling piece of information at a, at a broad level, just showing not all of these data sets are actually going to show this O18 water versus temperature trend. Um, that's not surprising considering there's a lot of other things that can influence the O18 of water than just temperature. So this happens to be a case where whatever's going on, you don't see that, you don't see temperature as a dominant control on the O18 of water in these soil nodules. The other thing from a standpoint of this study in particular that's interesting is it really suggests your cements and your nodules are reflecting two different water sources. Um, and so going back to their original interpretation of this data set as a shift in O18 of carbonate reflecting an uplift event, that shift stratigraphically coincides with when you go from nodules in the lower part of the section to everything above the shift are cements. So I think it's very possible that what drives that O18 carbonate shift is not tectonic at all, and is just a reflection of different O18 water sources um, because you're dealing with different carbonate types. Okay. And so then we can look at this as um, we've returned, I have ongoing work back in the sheet pass formation. I worked here as a PhD student interested in what elevation this lake basin was at because it sets the stage in the Western US tectonically for sort of how high that uh, Andean style um, high of relief, low elevation plateau could have been before you move into the sort of complexities of the Cenozoic tectonic story out there when you go from a dominantly um, contractional state to a dominantly um, extensional state in a lot of parts of the Western US. So, um, one interesting thing in those data sets, so again, these are what we consider the primary unaltered carbonate. Here is a recrystallized piece of carbonate. Here is some secondary um, uh, uh, calcite fracture fills that give us some perspective on burial fluid. So again, um, and this has actually, this has changed a lot as we've been adding a bunch more data to this data set, which is these are not the hottest temperatures we've been able to see. So in this lower resolution data set, um, but we still don't see particularly hot temperatures. You're still seeing things cap out at the 50, 50 to 60 degree range for some of these secondary carbonates. Um, but this has, if you look, if you zoom back in on the, what we think are the primary carbonates um, that should reflect lake water temperatures and lake water O18, here you have a, a significantly steeper slope of about 0.9 per mil to, per degree C. And you know, as we talked about on that first broad slide, you also really change from um, some low um, O18 values to some high low O18 values in that data set. And so I think in this relationship, what you're looking at is consistent with um, a slope that's consistent with more influence of evaporative enrichment um, on the data set that you maybe don't see in some of the soil waters. Okay, so in looking at each of these different individual data sets, trying to kind of put, see what behaviors they have and what makes sense in each of the contexts and get some general um, lessons out of this. Um, not surprisingly, the O18 of water records derived from CAP47 temperature data sets, they contain a lot of climate information. I think there's a lot of hope that we're gonna be able to do some cool things with paleohydrology. And if I can get the context for how, especially in areas where um, we have these nice temperature versus O18 relationships from the data set. I think there's something to be learned from, from the variation in slope about the influence of evaporation. And you know, that can be one way to link back to sort of the paleohydrology story. Um, if we're gonna tease out, right, there's a whole group of people out there using the O18 of water to say something about elevation. So just like we have with the temperature records, um, we need to figure out a way to tease out the hydrologic story in those data sets from what's going on with elevation. And again, I think the sort of combination of really understanding the carbonate lithology and facies controls and what you expect to see in some of these different settings will be important as well as getting this spatial and temporal context um, for the broader data sets to tease these apart. Um, and the other thing that's true is that like many other things that have happened associated with pumped isotopes, some of the conventional wisdoms we apply or have applied based on just the C13 and the O18 of carbonate are probably not going to be true all the time. And so what we need to be doing is adding more um, independent measurements of the O18 of water when we're doing some of these um, modern analog um, studies with clumped isotopes so we can get a better idea for 
when we think about carbonate formation, what OET, what water are we also getting? Um, whether that's related to seasonal biases or not. Um, and, that, and also how we would identify evaporation. So um, I, will I will finish my talk kind of in where we're going right now to address some of those things. So both soil temperatures kind of from terrestrial carbonates has been the area most explored from a quantum isotope perspective. And that's also starting to be true from a water perspective. So this was a nice study that came out in 2019 by Tyler Huth, who is working with um, Therese Serling and, uh, and others. And in the soil hydrology community, there's been a move to get better measurements of soil water O18 using these cool membrane probe devices where you put a little tube down uh, in the ground. Um, the portion that goes into your soil profile has, is uh, water permeable and you run dry nitrogen gas down those lines to create um, a vapor gradient and it'll draw soil water across the membrane um, into the um, tubes. People run that up to the surface and then typically they take like a Picaro or some other you know, uh, cavity ring down or laser based uh, water isotope analyzer into the field with them and measure it on the spot. And that's pretty cool. However, if you're interested in very specific soil types that make carbonates, you often can't do the study in your backyard. So that means you either go out into the field and you buy a $100,000 Picaro and put it out with all of your soil monitoring things and leave it there, which that's an expensive way to go. And as we, uh, most of us who've done this kind of work um, also realize um, people like to mess with your stuff in the field when you leave it for a while. So, um, we were interested in, in applying the use of these probes, but finding a way to capture that water that gets pulled out of the soil and kind of hold it in the field and then bring it back to the lab to measure. Um, so, you know, this was, this was nice, but it gets a resolution where you're starting to get the seasonal resolution. So once um, every month or so is the resolution of their soil water data. And you can see from this trajectory, when you're looking at O18 versus Delta D space, Right, things are kind of falling on this evaporative trend with the most evaporative soil waters being the most surficial um, soil samples, whereas the things at deeper depths, greater than 40 centimeters, are actually much closer to tracking the global and local meteoric water lines in the region. So in other words, a less evaporative influence. And a lot of the carbonates we take tend to be from these deeper profiles. Okay, so, the punchline is though, we need, some, we need some more of these higher temporal resolution records of O18 soil water um, as its own measure to both help with understanding carbonate, um, timing of carbonate formation that'll be useful. Um, and also understanding, you know, if you get heavy O18 of water, is it because it's a summer water? <laughs> is it because it's evaporatively enriched? Um, what can we actually figure out? So this is ongoing work by my, this is, um, what my student Rachel Habernack has been working on as a part of her PhD with me at CU. So we, to address this need, we made the SWIS. This is, Rachel came up with the acronym. It's the Soil Water Isotope Storage System. And the first step of this was just proving to ourselves that you could take glass flasks um, and capture and actually preserve the OET in the water and the Delta D for up to a month of storage of the water vapor in those flasks. Um, this, and I won't bore you with the details of the setup, um, but it incorporates these vapor permeable probes that I told you about, a very large Velcro valve that helps move everything around into suites of different flasks. Um, and she did a whole suite of different, um, and then, you know, in the lab, we started this with just lab experiments. If you can't hold the signal in the controlled conditions of a lab, <laughs> no point in taking it out to the field. So we started this in the lab. These are kind of the processes she went through of filling the flasks and then storing, um, sitting and storing them. And we started with overnight tests as well as 24 and 30 day tests. And the basic punchline is, you know, at this zoomed in level, you can see um, the before and after where there's um, good reproducibility of what went into the flask versus what we measured when it came out. And all of these were done basically on just DI water. And if you zoom out to broader context for a few different reference waters she measured, all of those different tests are within this kind of cloud of data here. 
So things basically reproduce at about one to a precision of about one to two per mil, which is as good as we're ever going to get because that's about the precision associated with making these um, measurements via this probe system. The probes themselves have an uncertainty that kind of caps out at about one per mil. So um, we move forward from there to actually automating them and starting to deploy them in the field. So this is a Swiss device actually built. It goes into a big, um, a big Pelican case. Um, here's our central Velcro valve that um, links to a bunch of these different flasks. Um, and we're deploying them to ask the sort of first question we're excited about that will also help us refine this um, system as a, as a nice tool um, is focus on this question of fine grain and clay rich soil. So we are instrumenting three different sites in Northeast Colorado, Nebraska, um, two, two in Colorado and one in Nebraska that have fine grain, relatively clay rich bee horizons where all the carbonate is forming. Um, so this is Rachel in the field, getting last little bits and pieces ready to deploy. You build a bunch of holes so you can see this is where all of those membrane probes are coming out of the soil profile where they've been put in at different depths. There are temperature loggers in there as well. And there's a soil gas well that's now installed in this wall. You build a small grave for, for your box. Um, and then everything goes inside. So the big box goes in the hole. We even put our dry nitrogen tank in there and a bunch of other things. Um, and it all get capped, gets capped. We installed the solar panels on top of a piece of plywood that sits to kind of cap the hole. So it's not so obvious. Um, and we've, when possible, we've been tying these to some of these coag met sites where um, they've been monitoring um, local, um, the local weather. Um, so we can tie a bunch of our results into those data as well. Okay, so that's just where we're going to try and get at some of the information we want about the OET of water. Um, so we can do more with these ancient data sets. And then, as I said, my student Rachel is trying to do some of the same work, but related to cluster and carbon information. Okay, so I will leave you guys with the conclusion slide. I think detailed lithology combined with the geochemistry is gonna be really important for making um, most use of all the CAP 47, C13, and O18 temperatures on the carbonates. We're generally seeing biases, I think, to summer conditions, but there's gonna be a lot of flavors of how that plays out. Um, and the O18 in water may not reflect the same seasonal bias as the temperature, which I think is an interesting possibility. And soil water may not always show an evaporative signal. It may turn out, especially if we're in these deeper horizons, where we're getting a better view of the O18 in water, um, that's less modified than evaporation than we originally thought, but it could be more that it's giving us a seasonal signal. And we're starting to work with Naomi Levin to send some of these O18 water samples to them um, so we can see um, how that view kind of plays out with a more sensitive um, measurement that reflects, um, uh, will reflect evaporation. Um, invariant O18 carbonates, you know, when we're going out and exploring, could be a sign that you're dealing with a data set that has temperature control on the O18 of water, and that's why the O18 of carbonate has been um, relatively invariant. Um, and then it's worth remembering that, you know, even getting back to these more constrained O18 water estimates, this is still itself a composite record that has a lot of competing influences that will require a bunch of information to kind of tease out the bits and pieces of information we want to know. Okay, I will stop there. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. It was uh, super interesting. Um, right. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Um, I, I was about to ask if anybody has uh, questions. You can, you can, you know, keep the screen on or off, uh, depending on, uh, yeah, maybe you can stop it so you can see everybody. Yeah, Hadith, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question um, <clears throat> about the um, high resolution sampling of water that, that you introduced at the end. At the end of the day, the carbonate in the soil averages out a lot of time. Um, why are you looking specifically for uh, high resolution water? I think it's to, so if you get at, yeah, a, a soil carbonate nodule is gonna potentially, 
integrate what we measure from a clumped isotope perspective was going to integrate anything from decades to thousands of years, depending on, on what you're actually looking at. But you can imagine that average could be, um, you know, many years of a weird weighted average of punctuated summertime conditions. So what we're trying to understand doing the high resolution work in the modern is it, one of the nice things that I didn't mention also in Tyler's paper is they've done some really nice um, carbonate system modeling associated with all of the high re their high resolution data. And it really shows that you're basically getting the nuance of what, what your end carbonate nodule is, is a weird formation of all these particular periods of time in the year that are, that, uh, you know, the combination of temperature plus soil CO2 plus the influence of soil dry down for helping um, saturate your ions means you're getting carbonate formation in weird punctuated times in the year, you also get periods of dissolution. And so, you know, if you can understand that annual cycle, um, you know, you can envision your soil carbonate nodule as an average of that weird time, many years repeated. And so actually, I, I think it's important to get the high resolution in the annual to understand those dynamics. So then you can trace out and say, okay, well, what I'm really getting is an average of seven days in July um, from this year and eight days in August and, and whatever, um, many years in a row. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? I'm gonna ask one. Um, <laughs> so, well, actually two. So, so first, first question, do, do, you, do we have any, or do you have any idea how many years are averaged or how many summers, uh, how many, you know, weeks in, in summers are, are average. Like, are we looking at thousand years, or how how much time the system remains open? Are you you mean from a soil perspective? Like, what yes. is a, a for, soil for, for, yeah, nodule? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, I, the time scale question is a really interesting one because it turns out you can get soil carbonates forming in climate conditions everywhere from semi like subhumid to really arid. And soil development rates vary hugely across those climate conditions, right? So um, if you think about the modern perspective, a lot of the desert soils in the Southwest US, you know, those things can, they go beyond Holocene and can represent like a million, you know, an integration of a million years on the carbonate, even though it's conducive for carbonate formation, it's still growing slowly in that perspective. Um, that the timescales are, can be a lot shorter um, in say, you know, Southern Minnesota and Iowa, Midwestern soils where it's, a, you know, you're in that subhumid to sub arid region. If we, if we apply that tra like spatial transition we have now or, or sort of modern climate range, you know, to the geologic past, the Bighorn Basin is a great example here for this. People argue that individual soils and they actually have the chronology to do it. It's this rare, uh, uh, let me give one version of background on um, the Bighorn Basin. So it's a pretty unique environment that um, the basin is basically all from the late Paleocene to Eocene is just, the stratigraphy is like stacks of Paleocene horizons. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unusual in the respect that you get a relatively invariant um, suite of facies. There aren't any lakes um, preserved and what you get in terms of diversity are, you know, sandstone bodies in there related to the, um, the fluvial system um, and um, crevasse blaze depositing sand out on the um, overbank region. So they just have stacks and stacks of paleosols and they have a crazy um, age framework from all the biostratigraphy, paleomag. It's like, you're going to go anywhere and try and study high resolution things in a terrestrial basin. That's the place to go because they actually have the framework to do it. And so they know that some of these individual paleocell horizons really represent only like a thousand years of time. Presumably mm -hmm. this is because it's a really warm environment in the Eocene. And while it was sometimes drier, it was also generally on average wetter conditions. And so soil development rates were fast. So right. the average there is like a thousand years and any of the individual carbonate nodules that said, you know, any given nodule could be like decades to a hundred years of formation time. 
So it can be it can be time averaging a lot of different times, depending on what you're looking at. Thanks. Uh, I have another question, but maybe someone else want to ask first. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by the fact that um, you don't see any effect of evaporation over your soil carbonates. I mean, it, it kind of contradicts, you know, the way we think about the format. How, so, so how are we forming, right? If it's not through uh, no evaporation and, 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 and degassing. Um, I think it's, I, this is where it gets really interesting about the sort of, from a, from a soil perspective, the temporal patterns and the disconnect of different parts of the system, right? So I suspect that what it's reflecting, it's not saying that the, the soil dry down aspect of it, like the concentration of ions is not important. It's just saying that um, time scales of infiltration and storage of the water at the level that the carbonate is forming at um, mm -hmm. can be somewhat independent from things happening higher in the soil, which is where you're going to start concentrating ions, right? Like the upper parts of the soil are your zones of leaching from a from a, both cation and anion. So if you think about the, the calcium side of this, right? Like you're mobilizing all the calci calcium in the upper parts of the soil profile and bringing them downward. So you need the infiltration um, and you can imagine you can dry some things out there but what's getting imprinted from an O18 perspective is the water at deeper parts of the profile that may have infiltrated fast. And especially if it's a clay rich horizon is trapped there longer, hmm. um, but is at deeper levels where it's then not, um, not being influenced as much by evaporation. So I think the dynamics of what's going on in the shallow part versus the, the deeper part are gonna be really, become really important in understanding what soil water you're getting. Okay. This is um, why I think it's, it kind of goes into that idea that you could get a different seasonal bias to the O18 of the water that's different from the timing of carbonate formation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely a question. And that's where I'm hoping, again, the higher resolution records will help make some of that clear because then you should be able to track how right. water is kind of passing through the system and what's ending up in the horizon where the carbonates are forming versus what's happening elsewhere. Got it. All right. Um, okay. I think unless we have uh, one more question. Okay. I think we're good. And, <laughs> and so, so thank you very much. Uh, it was super interesting. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you here in, uh, in March. So to see the yeah, I'll be really excited. We should have, um, we should have more information from this. Rachel brought her first soil water box back home and should be making measurements from that. So probably by next March, we'll have a, an interesting data set that includes the summer and into the fall. So yeah, that'll be awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Thanks Thank for you. inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Hope. Yeah. Really hoping to see you guys in March. Thank you. Bye guys.